Hello, and welcome to the Offensive Security Podcast. I am Dr. Heather Monty, your, ho- your co-host for today's podcast, along with Jeremy. Joining us today is Dr. Timothy Summers. Dr. Summers is an ethical hacker, professor, TED speaker, and leading expert in cybersecurity strategy, blockchain technology, and how hackers think. Timothy specializes in the scholarship and practice of hacker cognitive psychology, otherwise known as the hacker's mindset, and normal chaos paradigm, enabling him to advise on building and sustaining organizations during times of uncertainty. Hello, past couple of years, right? Dr. Summers is also the executive director of product development at Arizona State University here in the United States. Welcome, Dr. Summers. Thank you for having me. We're excited to have you here. So tell us a little bit about your background and and how it is that you got into cybersecurity. Oh, man. How do any of us get into cybersecurity? Uh, (laughs) For me, I don't know if it was like this for you guys, but for me, I think I got hacked. That's what it was. Uh, (laughs) And there was a... Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. When, you know, I was really young, high school. Um, uh, no, no, no. Actually, I remember uh, this was man. This was way early. Jeez, wow, it's been a long time. So, growing up in New York, um, I was in man, uh, maybe somewhere around like eleven and a half, twelve years old, messing around on the computer, and um, in a chat room, a guy sent me. Um, you know, of course, you know, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, right? The guy sent me a, uh, a uh, what at the time I thought was an innocuous app. And, um, you know, this is, I don't know, we'll have to do the math. I don't remember what year this was, but it was definitely in the 90s of some point. And, um, you know, look, I opened it up and the thing about it was it showed you a movie while it was uh, deleting every file on the computer. So it was at the time they called them a Deltree virus, which was, man, probably dating myself quite a bit. But like, um, literally, it was showing me, you guys ever seen a movie where someone sneezes and there's particles floating through the air? It was like showing particles floating through the air in a computer, destroying everything it touches. And on the right side of the screen, like every file was being deleted. And I was thinking, my mom's going to kill me. (laughs) So um, that was uh, the first time I really sort of got slapped in the face with security. And I said, man, I got to learn this. This is really cool. Um, and that's, that was, I think that was the start of the bug. That, that's awesome. I think like, I always like to compare, I think security and nursing is kind of the same thing of, of the, the ways people get into security is usually because they either had a really good experience um, in the healthcare sector, or they had a really bad experience in the healthcare sector. And I think that happens with security too. It's usually, usually it's something happened that was really bad. It's like, okay, you know, I need to help. I need to fix this. I need to help protect people. Um, so I, I think that that's, that's interesting. The people that I talk to, it's a, it's a common theme for sure. Yeah. So let, let's, let's talk a little bit about something about you that's just not related to tech or cybersecurity. We're going to talk all about that in the podcast today, but what, just tell us a little something about yourself that's just completely unrelated to technology or cybersecurity. You know, that's, um, man, you're asking some good questions. It's good to talk about stuff other than cyber, right? Or tech, even though that's like the day-to-day, we're like totally uh, bombarded with it. Um, so outside of technology, you know, I love traveling, um, love, uh, totally, I, I don't know. I don't, won't go as far as to call myself a foodie, but I definitely know really good food, at least if it's really good to me. <laughs> um, and you know, that, those are the two things I really, you know, I really enjoy. I enjoy exercise. Um, you know, I feel like, you know, we got to keep our minds sharp. Um, and, uh, yeah, I would say that those are probably my the things and areas where I really uh, spend a lot of time. And of course, family is, is, I enjoy having family in all of those places. If there's good food, if there's good travel, like whatever the case is, like surround me by family and friends and I'm good to go. Um, And being in Arizona, I recently discovered hiking. I didn't realize I was going to be someone who's really into hiking, but man, this is the best place to do it. Oh, for sure. For sure. I, I, I got into hiking. I've been, I've been an outdoorsy person my whole life, but because of the pandemic and that, and I also live in Arizona, I got into hiking and, um, and this is a fantastic place to live. Um, to, if you get into hiking for sure. Definitely. Timothy, it sounds like you're very well-rounded and that's, that's really great. I love when we can get uh, guests on here that our listeners can hear, like not everyone's in front of the computer all the time, just doing cyber stuff. Um, so that's really great. Um, but speaking of cyber, you are known for your work on, 
uh, hacking cognitive psychology and the hacker mindset. Um, at Austec, we talk a lot about mindset, but I'm sure that what we talk about is very different than um, what you think about. Uh, so can you explain what you mean by the hacker mindset and why it's important? Great question, Jeremy. Um, you know, there is a layer of, of uh, the work that we do um, that really is, you know, rooted in tech, very logical, very, um, you know, you know, uh, technique based, tool based. But there's an, a, another layer of that, too. You know, as hackers or cybersecurity professionals or really any kind of uh, robust innovator, I think it's really important to realize that there's another piece of our minds that's in, in this process. There's another part of our thinking. Um, and, and so when we think about um, the hacker's mindset, we're really talking about sort of that, that uh, the software in your head that uh, is helping you process uh, all of this amount, these amounts, vast amounts of data, uh, you know, uh, various kinds of processes and patterns that are happening out there. I mean, if you, if we just look at, you know, cybersecurity attacks over, you know, what the last two decades, I mean, even the, the techniques are, are, are shifting, they're changing, they're evolving really more than anything else. And it's, it's not that we're not leveraging the, the sort of traditional classical ways but it's just that hackers are, are evolving and they're thinking around these things. Um, we've got new emergent technology that's coming out. You know, how are, uh, are some of the best hackers staying ahead in those spaces? Um, it's because of the mindset that they have. Um, the hacker's mindset is all about uh, really being able to innovate in these completely uncertain environments. Um, and, and that really is a, at the heart of the matter. <laughs> so I said that we probably think different things, but it turns out we don't. Uh, <laughs> I, I really, I really do. You, you hit, you hit the word uncertain, and I think that that's really important. Um, being able to think about something that you've never seen before, a, a new environment, a new type of computer, a new type of network. Um, that is really something that is important for for hackers to develop. Absolutely. You know, I. I... Uh, I, I might, may or may not get this quote wrong. I think it may be, uh, might have been Emerson, but uh, there was a quote that I once heard that really uh, struck, you know, deeply for me was, um, you know, that, that, the, that what is, you know, what is in you is new to nature. And it was, you know, I think the hacking community is a really, really interesting community to sort of reflect on that in. Uh, because you just see so many representations of uh, of experts and what it means to be an expert and what it means to be uh, sort of in the hacker's mindset, uh, you know, in, in this sort of, uh, sort of uh, in my research, really, you know, rooted in one piece of it was a state of flow. But this idea that um, there is a, a way of thinking, uh, that there are patterns of thinking and that there are people out there who are able uh, to do that kind of thinking on the fly and in these really robust, uh, normally chaotic environments, which I also call uncertain. I mean, you know, this is, uh, to, to quote a, a, you know, a famous academic in the cybersecurity space, hackers are, you know, the uh, innovative wellspring of our time. Hmm. So, so for our listeners, any of you that have done any sort of graduate level work, master's degrees, doctoral programs, you, you dig through research. And a lot of times it's very, very dry reading. Um, it's not intended to be read like a best-selling book or anything. Um, but I did read Dr. Summers' uh, doctoral dissertation, which was on how hackers think. He, he spent a lot of time uh, in, in, in interviewing and observing and just really trying to understand the, 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 the cognitive processes that happen uh, within hackers. And there were, and I will say this, that uh, I've read a lot of dissertations. I've read a lot of uh, peer reviewed research and it's, it's very dry, but Dr. Summers dissertation is one I actually sat down and read and it was extremely interesting. So if you are interested in reading it, you, know, you can look it up online. Um, but in the dissertation, you know, there were, there are two recurring themes. We, we saw a lot of creativity and curiosity. Um, and that's one thing that I feel like I've been saying for a long time, that this is this you know, the, it's not a linear way of thinking. Uh, we, we need to inspire creativity. We need to foster curiosity. So what are some ways that em, uh, employers and leaders and organizations can help foster those two characteristics in their employees? Heather, first and foremost, I got to say, you know, thank you for reading my dissertation. Um, you know, I think you and I talked about this. Like that is a, one of the utmost um, just 
highest levels of esteem anyone a uh, researcher can have is that there was one other person who read it and actually got value. <laughs> uh, so that at least, you know, feels like um, the, the work. We always said that, uh, you know, I just wanted to, I always said I wanted to just make one brick of contribution. And at the very minimum, just even being able to talk about it is that is, is definitely leaning in that brick. Um, you know, you hit on two really important parts. You know, I kind of want to kind of sh you know, share with you how where I was trying to get to, because I guess like a lot of things, I was trying to get to something somewhere a little bit different. And I sought to really try to understand, you know, how hackers learn and how they perform forward thinking. And so this idea of, you know, um, how could per se, you know, you have a hacker learning new technology uh, and, and new things on the fly and being able to sort of apply them and create new strategies sort of emerging and down the line. And, and it was like, wow, this, this, the shifting in mental models is, is so amazing. You know, if you look at the literature historically, you know, one of the biggest things that, that really distinguishes a human being uh, from, you know, an animal, for, for example, uh, is mental models, being able to construct mental models in your mind and, and, and to be able to even create derivational models, right? Um, and so that was really exciting to me. And so we really think of this uh, dynamism of mental models as learning. So, you know, uh, you even hear some uh, people say that, uh, you know, maybe talk about neuroplasticity and the neural pathways. And so the sort of cognitive psychology aspect of this is, you know, that the best learners are really good at shifting mental models and being very dynamic with those mental models. And then in terms of the forward thinking piece, you know, hacking requires anticipatory thinking uh, to adapt to changes in the environment, to adapt uh, to, to uh, unforeseen waves of emergence that are coming down the line that we just, you know, just can't be uh, completely aware of all the time. And when I looked at the literature and in terms of what the community already knew, it was incredibly prevalent that creativity improved performance for technologists, that uh, you could see it, whether it was in coding, whether it was in system design, uh, you name it. And then we also saw that curiosity is a core driver of learning to code, for example. And, you know, when you think about that, uh, the way we sort of, sort of, you know, learn that the mind utilizes curiosity sort of as an exploratory uh, trait and as, as an exploratory feature, being interested in exploring the unknown and the new, and then really creativity being this element of, uh, of sort of, you know, innovative uh, uh, spark, if you will, in terms of how you might be able to, to create and learn and do problem solving. So, so there was this sort of massive um, convergence around those things. And what we didn't know, which was what was more exciting to me was, what are the primary factors uh, in a hacker's mind or, or, or sort of cognitive skills and abilities that a hacker has that really sort of encourages or influences the way that one solves problems, the way that one may adapt, uh, the way that they learn, perform forward thinking. And so, uh, in terms of, you know, the applicable and the practical for, you know, let's say if you're hiring, uh, one of the first things I would say is you need to be intentional. Um, you absolutely need to be intentional about the kind of hacker you're hiring for, what kinds of skills are you aiming for them to really sort of execute on. And, and I mean, technical skills, but then also cognitive skills, because really, if you you know, the way that my research sort of outlines the cognitive skills of hackers is you absolutely must have a uh, rich and robust domain expertise. Um, you, it is really important that a hacker have uh, this sort of natural curiosity. Um, you can assist in developing curiosity, but uh, it, it really is, uh, you really do get a completely a uh, different kind of thinking pattern when you have someone naturally curious. Uh, creativity is this space where uh, it really is about challenging uh, the mind and the, and the person to think outside of the normal bounds, the normal constraints. And so if you give the person a, uh, a challenge, puzzle, task, whatever it is, with very finite constraints, um, you know, 
seeing how they do problem solving or solution finding, uh, which are two, you know, sort of different framings of the same thing in a way, um, you'll get a lot of sort of understanding of what their sort of spectrum of solution finding looks like. Uh, ambiguity tolerance is one that is uh, is quite fascinating because, you know, what I found is that, you know, it's it's for many hackers, it's not necessarily that they're tolerant of the ambiguity. It's actually that they don't like the ambiguity so much that they dig into it to try to make it less ambiguous. Uh, so, so there is a little bit of a, of a sort of um, a framing and a way to think about that. And then lastly, you know, um, you know, at, in the early stages, I sort of referred to it as diagramming, but, but really it's about representation of the mental models. You know, how a hacker is able to sort of uh, uh, take what uh, they see and then in the mind's eye, if you will, and then be able to actually represent that uh, to where you may be able to work with others or even just for clarity of one's own understanding. So, so you know, I would encourage, uh, you know, if you're looking to hire uh, really amazing hackers, uh, it is about understanding those skills and traits and, uh, and really, really fine tuning for yourself uh, what sort of um, where on the spectrum for each of those skills and traits, uh, your hiring really needs to be. Um, wow, there's there's so much to unpack there. Um, uh, let's start with the mental models. Um, just for our listeners who might who might not have heard this term before, um, I think it's been used in in two contexts. Are you are you talking more about saying um, that the hacker is going to be building a mental model of a machine or a mental model of the network they're hacking, or are you referring more to um, specific mental models that are applied in various domains, like, I don't know, like, like Bayes theorem or, or Hanlon's razor, which of those two are you referring to, or is it both? Actually, uh, it's both Jeremy. Great, great question. Um, because in essence, the way that, you know, the way that I sort of, uh, see it is human beings are creating mental models all the time. You know, mm -hmm. if we go back to Craig's work, um, and, you know, who's considered kind of a forefather of, of thought around mental models, um, you know, uh, and even if you look at Dewey's work in terms of how people, you know, how people think and, and, and how we learn, um, there just is a, is a multitude of ways that human beings utilize mental models. And in many cases, um, you know, the mental models that we learn in our fields, um, then really sort of either in one way, they may you know, first time mental models, fresh thinking, creating new neural pathways to sort of develop mm -hmm. that thinking. Um, or they could be supplementary to mental models that we already have. And we may create new ones from that. And, and in my research, I refer to those as, as sort of derivative mental models. You've now created this new mental model from uh, an understanding that I might have already had and then maybe some new understanding that I'm now gaining. And so then now I say, wait a minute. Okay, I see how those things come together. This is how I see it. And then you might have a new derivational model there. Um, and, and that's really, really powerful, especially when it comes to hackers. Um, the effectiveness, what I found is the effectiveness of hackers really does depend on the dynamism of their mental models. Um, <laughs> and, and, and what I mean by that is I found that if you take a hacker who is incredibly skilled uh, technically already, um, the more sort of environments that you can comfortably introduce that hacker to, um, and, and, and the more they're able to really sort of uh, dynamically introduce that, their, that information, there's a, there's a um, theoretical term out there, their absorptive capacity, sort of the ability to sort of bring in this new information, they can be incredibly effective. Uh, it is, you know, I don't want to speak to, you know, sort of limit, limitless in terms of like a human's capacity, but really, there really are no bounds to how uh, just amazing those models can be applied. Uh, definitely, if the mental model dynamism is there. So let, let's talk a little bit more about um, innovation um, and, 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 and applying that to how hackers think. And so what are some ways that organizations can, can, can learn from your research and, and applying how hackers think to to improve innovation in their companies. I'm thinking about, you know, companies that they're trying to invent new things and they're trying to develop new products and not necessarily just for the, you know, the hackers or the offensive team, 
but for the whole company, you know, how, what, what can an organization take from, from what you know about how hackers think to help improve innovation and in, increase innovation? You know, that's a really great question. Um, I would say that the hacker's mindset is at the core of innovative thinking. Um, you know, what could be done, you know, with the findings from, you know, my research and what I've learned from hackers all these years, you know, the first thing I really sort of thought about uh, early on was this idea of how can we help, you know, the, you know, the sort of the, um, the good guys be better. You know, how can we, you know, figure out how to help ethical hackers be better uh, at their craft? And that was sort of one of the first places I sort of started uh, thinking. But then that also span expanded a bit to thinking about, you know, how could we do assessments of hackers? Um, you know, one of the early on when I started doing my research, I had gotten access to a, a really large um, network of hackers, which was wonderful. And it was just such a blessing. And uh, about 5,000 people, uh, in fact, it was just like, man, this is this could be amazing. And, and what, um, you know, I really thought about doing at that point was really sort of building an assessment of hackers from the perspective of themselves, because my research really has two ways of thinking about the hacker's mindset. There is one sort of hemisphere of the, of the mindset, if you will, which is around uh, personal reflection. And then this other part of it, which is around social exploration. And so the idea being, let's assess those hackers in their own abilities, right? So like, what does this hacker think about their own capabilities? And then also when we talk to others, who work with that hacker, you know, sort of what sort of is the, the sort of assessment of the capabilities uh, from that perspective and taking those two components. And then from a personal dynamic as just, you know, just me being a hacker who wants to kind of learn where I can do better and explore and all kinds of things like that, um, you know, really sort of taking this holistic approach to my own understanding of my own learning. And, and, and that really was one of the big drivers, you know, for me in the beginning um, and then starting to think about how do we apply that really sort of the other populations. But, you know, from the innovative uh, piece, I would say that, you know, you can't, you can have innovation without the hacker's mindset. However, um, the innovation really is quite short lived because if you look at the pieces that make an innovation last the test of time, much of it is about whether or not it can handle uh, within uncertain environments. Uh, also, can it handle within normally chaotic environments? And that's a you know a piece of research. Um, and it, for the audience here, you know, normal chaos sort of being you know the perspective of uh, of things uh, happening um, in our natural environment around us for which we have no control. Um, you know, like COVID nineteen didn't have any control over that, but it happened, <laughs> right? And so how do you, how do you, how do your innovations persist even in those kinds of environments? And that's really where the hacker's mindset is incredibly helpful for organizations. In terms of how to, you know, really sort of uh, proliferate that mindset in an organization, you know, it has to come through activities. Uh, it has to come through tasks. It has to come through culture. Um, you know, we have to encourage people to think uh, to think openly and creatively and be curious. Um, and we have to reward them for, you know, for that behavior uh, and, 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 and not so much about penalizing them for, you know, hey, I started down this path of this idea, but it turned out it didn't pan out the way I thought it would. We have to be okay with those things and, and recognize that it's about how we're trending. If, if we're, you know, if we empower, uh, you know, people throughout the organization, to think creatively, innovatively, to see. One thing I say to folks on my team is, hey, look, I need people who if they see a box sitting in the middle of the floor and they know we need a clear floor, like just go pick up the box. Uh, don't wait for anyone to tell you to pick it up, just go do it. And that's that kind of learning and growth together um, is really important even on an organizational level. There's so much to be learned from the way hackers naturally organize and applying that to organizations as well. Um, this, you know, within the, when I worked in the DOD, we had this perspective around how do you create, you know, sort of small autonomous teams. And I was thinking, well, that's really interesting. The military is thinking like that. And then I went uh, to Europe and I was doing crisis management in Europe. 
And uh, whenever something really massive would happen, they're creating small autonomous teams that sort of self-organized and they're self-specialized. And it just really revealed, um, you know, some elements that were similar in the way hackers would naturally organize. So just even some of those pieces of just seeing how the, the sort of capabilities and processes and techniques that hackers are using, um, they're being used all over the place. And I think that there's massive value in us teaching the hackers mindset to people across a variety of industries and sectors, because I think it could be applicable uh, in so many places and not just dealing with technology. I really liked uh, what you said about rewarding ideas and pursuing ideas, even if they don't pan out. Um, I'm not a I'm not a poker player. I don't know if you are, but I have a friend who is um, really really gifted at it, and uh, he has he has explained this concept of rewarding the play and not the result. Or so if you make like a great bet, even if even if it doesn't turn out that you got the right cards or the the your your opponent got better cards, you still want to mentally reward yourself for that because you made the right move. Um, so I I really like that. Um, I have two questions for you. I hope that they, I hypothesize that they are connected, but we'll see uh, based, based on your answer if I'm right or wrong. Um, number one, what, what do you think are some misconceptions of sort of the general um, agreed upon model of hackers? Like what, what do people have wrong about hackers? And um, the second question is, what do you think blue teams or defenders can learn from hackers in terms of applying sort of the hacker mindset to their domain? Oh, wow. These are great questions, Jeremy. Um, so on the first note, <clears throat> um, hackers, there's a total misconception around this. Um, you know, it, you know, everyone thinks about criminals and, you know, the sort of person mm -hmm. you see on TV. Um, <clears throat> you know, look, I mean, those guys look cool. You know, the ones that are like there and they're sitting there and they're doing their thing. Um, but I mean, that's really a really small view of a hacker. Um, I have seen hackers of so many different persuasions. Um, and so for me, the way I think about hacking, you don't have to be a technologist to be a hacker. Um, there really is something about hackers that there's like a natural proclivity to finding just you know, non-obvious solutions. Um, finding something that, you know, some, when you tell someone the solution and they say, huh, yeah, huh, I didn't think about it like that, <laughs> right? I mean, that's really, I mean, when, when you have someone who does that and you're like, yeah, man, okay. Yeah, I've learned something new from all of these brains coming together. Like that's where hacking really shines. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, you know, you know, I've got to uh, know some folks who can totally sit down at a keyboard and get to the command line and you point them in a direction and watch out. Right. But there's some people also who, you know, may get to a, um, you know, may not be able to do it with the computer per se. But uh, I'm going to go to something really, really traditional and classical. I've got a friend who is this way with cars. I mean, mm -hmm you can point him at a car and geez, he can, I mean, even if he's not seen the car before, like even if he doesn't know the car and I haven't found a car that he doesn't know, he can figure it out. And it's it just, you know, everything from, I've seen him work on everything from cars from the forties all the way up to Tesla's and he can tear them down and put them back together. It's almost like, he's just like a savant about it, you know, and he doesn't even think, he doesn't even think any way about it. It's just like, yeah, I mean, bring your car over. I'm happy to look at it. That's some of the best hackers I've found are like that, right? They're just like, hey, you know, yeah, I mean, I can write that up real fast. And, and you just sit there and awe, and you're like, wow, okay, <laughs> right? So I think that um, <clears throat> there's, there's really a huge plethora of hackers out there. I myself uh, have always considered myself an ethical hacker, probably because I always thought about, and it goes back to what Heather said earlier, um, uh, about protecting those close to you. I was always kind of worried about my mom and my aunties online and, you know, they don't know tech the way we do. And, you know, so it always just kind of like made me feel like, man, you know, I've got to be, you know, a, a good, you know, a good voice, you know, kind of protecting them in that deal. And not because I felt like I was inclined in any particular way, but because it just, I naturally gravitated to that stuff and they would naturally come to me with questions. So I think that 
you know, it's really wise and important for people to think about hacker, hackers as, as existing on a spectrum. Another thing, lastly, I would say about this is, frankly, I believe that anyone can be a hacker. Um, you know, it depends on what you want to point that energy toward. And I encourage everyone to be responsible and about, you know, and, and want to be an ethical hacker. But, you know, anyone really could learn the tools, techniques, processes, procedures, um, and even evolve their own uh, sort of cognitive skills and abilities to be a better hacker. Um, and I do think that in the future, I think we will think of uh, people in other fields as being hackers. Um, you know, I think that, you know, there may, there, there will be a room and maybe we won't use the word hacker. Maybe we'll use the word maker. Maybe we'll use the word innovator. But either way, we'll be talking about people who are able to think about these non-obvious solutions in trying times. Yeah, I think it's, it's you know, a lot of times you get a, a group of people and it's a bunch of engineers trying to solve an engineering problem, the old same old engineering way, right? And so sometimes when you get people with, uh, you know, just a little bit different way of thinking, maybe from a different background, um, it's, it, 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 you, they bring a different perspective to some of the, the, the problems that, you know, that we've been trying to solve and, and, and we, and we need a different perspective on it. Um, and so when, when an organization is, is thinking about, you know, hiring people that are, they're, they're ethical hackers, what, what kinds of things can, can recruiters and hiring managers, what kind of things can they, you know, look for in a, in a resume or in a, in a, in an interview, um, or even on the flip side, how can somebody who's, who, who is an ethical hacker, how can they really get across sort of the, 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 that they're thinking along the right ways? How do they, how do they describe that? And how does, how does a hiring manager ask for that? Yeah. Oh, okay. So great question. Um, you know, one of the things I would, I would look for, I would encourage folks to look for is uh, diversity of thought. Um, so, you know, are some of the best hackers are not only really good at the technical, but they're also really good at the real world things too. You know, what's happening outside of the box. Um, that's really important. You know, uh, it's one of actually Jeremy mentioned that earlier, like, you know, Hey, you know, being well-rounded um, that's really important. Another piece I would say is, um, you know, these days when I'm looking for really amazing hackers, I look for people who also have a, uh, diverse foundational uh, education. Um, you know, for example, I found a really amazing physicist one time who, man, I put him up against, you know, just about anybody. Um, that's something that I would encourage as well, looking for uh, sort of these uh, people with skills in these sort of transitive areas. Um, you know, it's not natural. You know, a lot of times, you know, folks, Again, I talked to a lot of my friends in cybersecurity, you know, they're like, hey, you know, why aren't you doing a pure cybersecurity job, you know, all the, like right now? And like, and well, one is because it's cybersecurity proliferates just about everything. So you kind of need to be aware of all these other emergent things that are happening around us. AI, you know, what everyone's now calling Web3, but, you know, you know, distributed ledger and all that stuff, understanding how those things connect to cybersecurity. Um, some of the best candidates uh, out there are going to have linkages amongst some of these really interesting emergent areas. You need people who can think across, uh, you know, not only these centralized environments, but also the de decentralized ones. You, you're right. So there's there's I would say that some of the best candidates and, and what you want to look for, again, remember that mental model dynamism, looking for, you know, uh, you know, people who are able to really sort of traverse uh, different areas. And it's not to say that you don't want people who are specialists. You do. Um, you know, one of my, uh, one of the, you know, most brilliant people I've ever met uh, talked about researchers as being, uh, you know, either foxes or hedgehogs. And so like, there's, you know, there's some researchers who are like, they go down a hole and they just go all the way down. Right. And then there's some researchers who say, Hey, you know what? I learned this over here. I'm going to go take it over there and see what I can find. You need hackers that are in both of those places, both of those mindsets. Um, so it, it is really about understanding the role. I think also, Jeremy, you mentioned about, um, about being, you know, sort of blue teams, um, and really what can the blue team learn from, you know, from hackers, for example, you know, look, I, I would say that, um, you know, if you're on a blue team, you've got to work twice as hard. 
Um, you know, because, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing for me to like, you know, you know, take advantage of some new tech, right? Like, let's just say I'm, I'm the, you know, the, the, the bad guy out there and there's some new tech that's come out and all I have to do is find some vulnerabilities in it. I don't really have to care very much about how they're going to be fixed or, you know, any of that. And I'm trying to make big impact anyway. So (laughs) let me just go for it. And then, you know, whereas, you know, folks that are, are trying to play protector or defender or guardian in some way, shape or form, you know, they have to not only understand how it's not working, uh, but also understand, OK, how can we potentially mitigate this thing uh, and if it becomes a real, you know, real big uh, uh, risk? And what is that, you know, you know, what is the proximity of that look like? Right. I mean, how, how do, what are the ripple effects of this? So I would say that, you know. Being foxes and hedgehogs uh, are incredibly important f- for your blue team um, because you're going to need, uh, you know, folks with that ability to go really deep. But you're also going to need folks who can, you know, sort of go, you know, they're not afraid to scuba dive, but they're not afraid to snorkel either. You know, you're going to need people yep. who can sort of play the field. And I think for a long time in cybersecurity, we've been just been so focused on specialists that, you know, we really sort of lost track of. Uh, the sort of, um, you know, mile wide, inch deep of some of the aspects of what we do um, and being able to really sort of, you know, recognize that there's massive, uh, you know, uh, sort of holes. <laughs> you know, if you're if you're out there, you know, learning in cyber, there are some real serious places where you can just go an inch deep and there's some places where you can go five miles deep. Um, and I think that it's important for defenders or guardians or protectors blue team uh, to have as much of that breath as possible. I've always loved that, that model. Uh, speaking of mental models, um, the it's so visual and it's so easy to like think of a little hedgehog being like so focused on something or a fox running around. Um, I love that. Um, what, are, um, what are some cognitive abilities or skills that you've mentioned a lot that hackers have, curiosity, uh, uh, creativity, what are some that really the best hackers have that separate them from the crop? Well, yeah. Um, you know, I would say that some of the best hackers that I've met felt a sense of responsibility um, mm-hmm. about their knowledge. Um, you know, I think uh, there was a, a hacker that, uh, you know, you know, met a lot of, have a lot of respect for, spent a lot of time with. And I remember, you know, us sitting down and talking and, you know, and them saying to me, you know, they were sharing a sort of experience that they'd had when they were advising on a, on a, uh, for a really big company and, you know, with some, you know, transportation stuff that we all use pretty regularly. And, and I remember the, them saying, you know, when I realized I could impact the lives of the people who take this form of transportation every day, it just really made me feel a completely different sense of responsibility. And uh, that was really powerful because, I mean, I mean, these were this is a hacker who could really change thousands of people's lives in an instant. <clears throat> um, I definitely found that uh, folks who recognized that there was a sense of responsibility with that talent, there was something really, really interesting and unique about that. Um, in in terms of sort of some of the cognitive skills, you know, there. You know, of course, you know, naturally people would think, well, domain expertise, right? You want people who are absolutely amazing at, you know, and they know their stuff. Uh, you know, you know, if you, they can spout off ports, you know, easily, they can tell you about any protocol they can, you know, they can, they can dig into just about anything, but, um, it really is a little bit more than just how, how much they know. Um, it really is also about what they know and how they apply what they know. Um, you know, one of the pieces that we found, I found was pretty interesting was around people attending, uh, conferences and conventions and things like that. And, you know, that was pretty exciting because, you know, in our field, um, you know, conferences are pretty popular and so are, uh, certifications. I mean, this is stuff that's like pretty big. And one of the things that we found was kind of interesting was just because you attend, uh, you know, conventions and conferences and things like that, and you attend them regularly, doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, you know, you are, you know, have a lot of domain expertise. In fact, you know, we found a lot of people who attend conferences are actually trying to go to learn for the first time, 
uh, as opposed to necessarily being like, you know, the, the sort of folks that you might go and, and, and want for your really complicated project. Mm -hmm. um, we also found that, uh, that uh, curiosity, and this is something I thought was really interesting, was actually uh, stronger for people who didn't attend conferences. But a lot of that was because many of those people actually were hedgehogs. Many of the people who weren't coming to conferences, for example, uh, sort of self-identified in this like, hey, I'm a specialist. I'm very focused on this kind of thing kind of way. And I thought that was kind of interesting uh, because it was like, huh, you know, OK, so there is a little bit of a of, of like some different patterns that are happening here. And, um, you know, it's just all of these sort of little things that we discovered about the hacking community and the way hackers uh, looked at themselves and looked at others and interacted with others. We just found incredibly, incredibly uh, fascinating. Um, earlier, I shared with you about diagramming and mental modeling. Um, you know, we found that, you know, for example, um, you know, people who attended uh, social gatherings actually were way more adept at uh, diagramming their mental models than others who weren't. But that made sense because these conventions are sort of knowledge exchange uh, events. So people coming there and and being good at, you know, or trying to be good at trying to explain the stuff that they've done and how complex it is made a lot of sense. So it gave us these really interesting insights into the community, uh, places where we could find certain kinds of talent as opposed to other kinds of talent, um, you know, places where we might be able to really sort of connect with that talent. And, you know, I, I think one of the uh, hardest things, I remember when I first set out to do my research, you know, my committee saying, well, how are you going to reach these people? You know, how are you going to find them? And, you know, and I basically said I was going to go everywhere to find them. Um, and I did. And I think that's exactly what we have to do as, as hiring uh, for hiring managers. You've got to be willing to look for the talent where, you know, where you meet it, right? Where it is, okay. right? And that may be, um, you know, it may be at-risk youth, you know, in New York City, who now are like getting into cybersecurity and and they're and they're doing, you know, really well at it. Um, so, I would encourage any hiring managers or HR consultants or HR staff looking for people in this space uh, to keep all of your options open because they exist everywhere. So let, let's build on that just a little bit. Um, and one thing I have been talking a lot about lately is that um, from the hiring manager perspective, there's not always this, you, you, you're, you're good, your best candidates don't always have a bachelor's degree in computer science or a bachelor's degree in security or IT. Uh, there's a lot of people that come from other disciplines. They got a degree in something else. They're working in a different field. Um, or they don't have a degree, uh, you know, they, they've been, they've, they're very well experienced in another field. So um, to take in your, your knowledge and your, and your wisdom from your research, but also you as a hiring manager, you, you've done a lot of hiring in the tech space. Um, what are some other you know, fields or disciplines that people come from that they've got this way of thinking? It's just now we just need to apply it to security. So what, what are some of those fields and what might be some advice that you would give to people that, you know, that maybe they have a degree in history or a degree in creative writing or something like that? What might be some advice that you would give to them as they're trying to transition into security? You know, I would, these are great. That's a great question, Heather. So on the security front and in terms of hiring, and so <clears throat> again, when I said, you know, you got to be intentional, I mean, I so mean that because, um, what we do and what I've, you know, what I've learned from just time in the field and also the research is we do a, dis a disservice to the candidates and, and just to the human beings and the human nature of the work if we aren't intentional about what we need the person to do, what kind of skills do we want the person to have, what kinds of really sort of unique interesting, cutting edge things are we going to ask them to do that are not clear cut and kind of ambiguous. I actually uh, think that every job description or role should have some level of ambiguity to it. I really do. I think that they're built in in some way, shape or form. Your best candidates are going to strive to get rid of that ambiguity because they're not going to like it. And they're going to want to be like, hey, look, you know, you know, Heather's asked me to do this and we don't have a system for this. So I'm going to map out a system that works for us. <laughs> right. So, you know, being at that level of intentional, um, recognizing that. I would also say another thing, if, 
And in terms of the fields, like I look for candidates who are from any field uh, to your to your question. Right. So, um, like I said, I've hired, you know, I look for people who have a physics background. Uh, like if I need someone who has a um, a really like who can be a really amazing security architect, for example, um, I might look for someone who's got uh, I want them, of course, to have the cybersecurity fundamentals If they don't have them. Like they got to have the, the really fruitful, robust understanding of cybersecurity. And they probably have, you know, uh, spent quite a bit of time in that kind of an environment. But in addition to that, uh, they might be a software developer at some point in their past. Um, in addition to that, they might have been uh, a physicist in their past. Um, or maybe they were a, a marine biologist. Marine biology is great because marine biologists understand ecosystems. Isn't that a pretty popular word in our field? So if you look at technology, if you bring someone who's a, who's a, you know, an organic biologist or, or something like that, you bring them in and you say, okay, here's the ecosystem that we're working in. Here's, here are the feeders, here are all the little things going on. They look at that stuff and they're able to think about it like it's a biological system and you've already gone to cloud nine because most likely your technologists are not thinking about it like a biological system. So um, just being able to bring that diversity of thought, this is the key to innovation. And, and think about that for a second. If the person, I'm picking on marine biologists here, but if the person's a marine biologist, and they're considering some technology thing or some cybersecurity thing, that in and of itself is like the ultimate curiosity, right? I mean, they're completely going out of their comfort zone and they're exploring something different and they're asking questions that we might say, hey, that's a weird question. Why are you asking that? Um, and they're just, you know, coming in with their, uh, with their expert naivety, right? And just you know, uh, chaos monkeying things up without knowing they are. And it forces us to build better systems. <laughs> so th that's really where I think, um, <clears throat> you know, there was a cybersecurity researcher who said that, you know, hackers are the immune system of the internet. But I really think that this mindset is really, uh, you know, how you build, uh, how you do solution finding in a world that needs uh, uh, survivable systems, one that needs resilience, one that needs... Uh, the ability to withstand, you know, as um, as uh, Taleb calls it, black swans, right? We we need uh, systems that are anti-fragile. Um, this mindset is how you get there. Uh, putting innovation at the core and as a, an important core of your functionality is important. Um, in terms of security, you know, there is a number of sort of aspects and ways that I, things that I think people should be taking into account right now. Um, if they're doing anything um, and I'm right now I'm building a product and like security is so important from day zero. Um, we wanted to take an, a Kaizen approach to it, continuously improving. Let's figure out uh, and let's use vulnerabilities as a, as a quality proxy for our software. Uh, you know, let's start, you know, challenging ourselves to, to use, uh, you know, a, a sort of vulnerabilities per build as a, as a metric. Um, let's start giving ourselves KPIs that, you know, that try to, you know, encourage us and force us to make better, uh, better tools and better software. And, you know, going back to uh, sort of early days of cybersecurity, I remember us asking the question, you know, how can we make sure that security is baked in and not caked on? Well, the way you do that is by making sure that it's in the product by design. That's the only way for the only way for us to build resilient systems like we know we need is by making sure that it's in the product design. Exactly. Um, so can, can you, let's build on that just a little bit. So you, you're, you, you talked a little bit about you're developing a product. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is, what you know, some of the other projects that you're working on in the tech space and, and sort of how you're bringing security into that. Tell us a little bit about some of the stuff you're working on. Yeah, yeah no. So right now, um, so I'm at Arizona state university. I'm, uh, you know, building uh, executive director of product development and, and really a space that they call Third Horizon. And a Third Horizon is basically means my job is to go out to the future, look at whatever tech is quote unquote out there and then figure out how to make it practical today. And, um, you know, I've been working in the cybersecurity space for man, a long time. I don't even remember what life was like before it really, but, uh, <laughs> right. but- Too many of us. 
<laughs> right, dude, right, seriously. And so over time, I've kind of also built, you know, um, uh, sort of a repertoire of work in the AI space and also in the space that folks are now calling Web3. And um, uh, I should probably just go ahead and accept that it's being called Web3. I, it just, <laughs> I, I just, it's, it's taking me a bit. I'm a little bit of a late convert. <laughs> Um, <laughs> not the only one, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I mean, so I've had an opportunity to kind of build in those spaces as well. And, you know, it's just been really interesting to see, and I've been working on projects in those different spaces, um, you know, on the AI side, I've had an opportunity to, to play around and, and, and really try to make some impact, uh, you know, building technology in the healthcare space, another space I'm really passionate about, um, you know, I've got, you know, so many folks in my family were impacted by diabetes. I'm working on a piece of technology, you know, to, to early screen for diabetes and protect people from blindness. And, you know, uh, but I'm really, really proud of the work that I'm doing at Arizona State University, which is, you know, uh, you know, the number one in innovation, which I'm really, I'm like so happy to be in a place that, you know, prides itself on innovation. And, you know, I, I approached the leadership team with an idea, a Web3 idea. Um, and I said, hey, you know, there is an opportunity for us to, you know, enable learners to capture all of the learning that they're doing, you know, whether it's degree seeking or non-degree seeking, whether I just went and took a boot camp and picked up some new cybersecurity skills and now I got a certificate or a digital badge or something. And actually to have a digital wallet for those credentials, as opposed to having a digital wallet for, you know, just cash or crypto or something like, hey, no, I mean, this is actually valuable. You know, the fact that we've all spent all this time training and learning and, 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 and doing, you know, really good work out in the community, we should be, you know, able to really sort of own the records of those things and be able to represent them uh, as part of our work and our repertoire and, and just who we are. So, you know, I designed this, uh, you know, been build, building this digital wallet and portfolio called Pocket. You can see it over here. <laughs> and, uh, and Pocket's a digital wallet and portfolio that enables learners anywhere to, to really be able to capture the evidence of their learning in the form of verifiable credentials. And so this stuff is, is not directly security, but it is security related because we built self-sovereign identity at the core uh, as a central component. So you're talking about decentralized identity or uh, maybe a, an area that some folks uh, may remember as being called DPKI. Um, you know, there really is this aspect of uh, creating these credentials that can be representative of, of the things that you've done and who you are and the things that you do and your expertise and that they're cryptographically verifiable uh, by others out there and uh, particularly employers or schools. And, and that, that's really the community that we're thinking about. But we put the learner right at the center of it. Um, you know, we said, okay, let's just strip this down and say, forget this idea of the learner having to be beholden to the institution and, uh, you know, always having to sort of have this like, you know, this sort of like weight cloud over your head that, you know, hey man, I don't really own my degree. I kind of have to pay these guys in perpetuity to prove it. Um, and so we just kind of wanted to flip that model on its head a bit and introduce some privacy by design and uh, let's build a digital wallet that was secure by design and that put the, the actual user at the center of it instead of putting the company at the center. Um, so those were just, you know, some of the sort of guiding principles uh, for what we were doing. And, and it's been it's been wonderful working with this uh, unique and emergent uh, decentralized identity technology verifiable credentials, uh, you know, being working with the Linux foundations and, and other, you know, just, you know, global standards bodies to really sort of figure this stuff out. It's really, really been exciting and, and very much a learning process Some brilliant people uh, out here working on all these different aspects of this stuff. So, um, so we're, we're just about out of time here. So do you have any sort of final thoughts for our listeners? Our listeners are Oftentimes they are people who are trying to uh, start their career in security. Maybe they're advancing their career in security. We also get a lot of, you know, um, cybersecurity leaders and managers listening as well. So what are, what would be some, some final thoughts that you have for our listeners today? Final thoughts, you know, if you're interested in cybersecurity, don't just sit on the sidelines, lean in, go for it. 
you know, reach out to any and everybody you can find. Uh, look for mentors that are out there that can sort of guide you in the right direction. Um, you know, I would say that um, don't be shy uh, because this is a field that is growing leaps and bounds. I just heard the other day that the state of Idaho has thousands of cybersecurity jobs that they can't fill. Uh, just as an example, um, there's many other places out there just like that. And uh, I would say, don't be afraid to dabble in a lot of different things. You know, uh, it, 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 in fact, you'll be better for it. Be interdisciplinary. Um, on the hiring side, I would say, you know, look for inter interdisciplinary candidates. Uh, be willing to look for talent uh, in places where others, you know, might not think to. Um, I'm a huge fan of uh, community colleges. I went to a community college. Community colleges have great talent, uh, but just, you know, folks overlook the community college talent. So, you know, be willing to, to meet the talent where it is. Um, I would also say, you know, if you're an organization out there, you should absolutely be uh, considering how the Hackers Mind Tech can help you with innovation, but also for hirers, how can it assist you in being more intentional? And, uh, you know, that's how I would, I would uh, sort of end it. Um, I can be found online at How Hackers Think. Um, and, um, you know, we're rolling out uh, little aspects of Pocket, which are going to be super exciting. So you can also follow, uh, follow me on LinkedIn and that work. Um, but I just really am uh, just so thankful and pleased and appreciative of being here. Thank you so much, guys. Yes, this has been Thanks a so nice conversation. We, we really enjoyed it. I know Jeremy and I were really looking forward to this conversation today. So thank you um, for joining us, Dr. Summers. And thank you for our listeners for listening in on our conversation. And we'll see you all in our next episode.